Uh, I want to give a plug for the uh, Panama Canal Treaty and hope that the good people of Iowa uh, will urge their senators to vote for it because I think that uh, the presence of 24 leaders of Latin America in, um, in, 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 the, in Washington, uh, the great desire of people everywhere to throw up the yoke of colonialism ought to be apparent today. And in my judgment, it would be the worst thing that could happen to us in foreign affairs if the United States Senate would refuse to ratify the, pa refuse to ratify, ratify the Panama Canal Treaty. We, for years in the country, in this country, have accepted uh, as part of our educational process, as part of uh, almost our concept as a nation, things about the Panama Canal that weren't true. And we have all of us since childhood have developed our attitudes based on uh, things that weren't true. The idea that we bought the canal, uh, or we bought the canal zone and it's ours, has been accepted. It's not true. We paid a certain amount of money down, and we agreed to pay rent in the original treaty of $250,000 a year. You don't pay rent on something that you own. So I think what we're dealing with here is, is, is a need First of all, to ask people you know, to look at the facts, both what is now, you know, what can be, what sort of treaty we have, and then make their decision, not on what we would do if the world was what we would like it to be, but on what we would do in the best interest of our country to deal with the world as it is. Good evening and welcome to At Issue. I'm Twyla Young. The two men that you just heard expounding upon the Panama Canal Treaty are Benjamin Hooks, Executive Director of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and Jody Powell, Press Secretary to President Jimmy Carter. The Panama Canal is not the only issue that concerns both of these men, and indeed on their recent visits to Des Moines, they talked at length about several problems facing this country. Unemployment, inflation, housing, foreign policy, and Burt Lance. Benjamin Hooks came to Des Moines for what amounted to only a few hours. His visit centered around the Des Moines chapter of the NAACP's annual Freedom Fund banquet. Before that event, Hooks met with reporters to talk about recent happenings and the future of the organization whose leadership he assumed after serving as federal communications commissioner. Hooks talked about a number of problems facing the black community and his organization's reaction to them. He spoke of black unemployment, of poor housing, of the deterioration of this country's cities, and he spoke of the Carter administration's ranking black United Nations Ambassador Andrew Young. Well, I think Andrew Young has done a tremendously good job. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the world, and as far as I'm concerned, is in a very pitiful condition. Uh, vessels of colonialism everywhere, uh, all kinds of problems, and those who criticized Young, it was strange. They never said that he was not telling the truth. They said he was not being diplomatic. It's my conception that if things are as bad as they are by virtue of us being diplomatic, perhaps it was time that we had somebody who was not quite as diplomatic. Secondly, uh, I think that the press uh, sort of uh, smelled the scent of blood, and they just simply would go through a whole speech that he had uh, it might be an hour long to find any one uh, statement that was sort of a, a ludicrous out of context. Well, doing a lot of public speaking, you don't speak for half hour without saying at least one thing that you might regret having said, you know, at a later time. And thirdly, uh, the last assessment I saw uh, seems to suggest that he's becoming more mature, more seasoned, and more diplomatic. And I'm not sure I like that so well because I think that he should retain his style. Certainly, I think he should grow with the job, but I hope he will not let the status quo power structure so constrict him that he fails to speak out where it's necessary. In spite, though, of his uh, outspoken comments about uh, colonial powers, particularly in Africa, he's been somewhat on the defensive, called upon to defend the Carter administration to uh, blacks here in this country, and uh, criticism has been very pointed. Do you feel as though he, this, is, that this is causing a sort of a schizophrenic problem for him? Well, no, I don't think it, it should, because in the first place, um, uh, the, the, I've been uh, in the vanguard of those who have criti been critical of the president on many points. 
Uh, but the, the strange and ironic thing is that uh, I had a chance to read Vernon Jordan's speech, for instance, and it was about uh, as much praise as there was criticism. Unfortunately, in, our, in today's world, uh, to speak, uh, you know, words of praise uh, ordinarily don't get much attention. The, cr the criticism does. So that uh, I don't know of any black leader who has said that President Carter is insensitive or not concerned or dedicated. We're simply really attacking his sense of priorities in terms of how he's proceeded to deal with the problems. Uh, I think that uh, Andrew Young had a perfect right to defend the president uh, if he were privy to information that we were not, uh, did not have. The president unveiled a welfare package. Uh, I don't think anybody could say that came as a result of criticism. Obviously, he's been working on it for a number of months. He has uh, nominated uh, Judge Johnson, one of the most outstanding jurists in America, to head the FBI. Uh, that's not a result of the criticism. He's been trying for six months to get in. I think that what Andrew Young was saying uh, was that there were some things the president is working on that will be unveiled in time. What we're saying is we want to see them on the table because the preoccupation with balancing the budget does not square with the promises you made to alleviate the conditions in our major cities. Shortly before Hook's visit to Des Moines, a report appeared that named violence the number one cause of death among young black men. Hooks commented on that report. It, the only thing amazing to me is it took America so long to find it out. Uh, I've been in the criminal justice system. I was a public defender in Memphis for many years, and I was a criminal court judge. I tried uh, literally hundreds of cases, and I've known, and most of the black community has long since known, uh, that uh, violent death among black people caused by black-on-black -black, uh, crime, and it comes always, for the most part, between so-called friends, you know, at parties, uh, at dances, uh, in the home. Uh, you know, they, you know, people take so long discovering things. One of the, uh, one of the worst things that happened in America today is the so-called wife-beating syndrome. Well, those of us who've been in the criminal justice system know that white people and black folk have been beating their wives since time immemorial. In fact, there used to be a time when we said that it was all right as long as the, as long as the stick was no bigger than your little finger. Well, we don't believe that now, thank God. But uh, it, it, my reaction is it doesn't surprise me because I knew it. 9,000 violent deaths in America last year among black people. Uh, at one, one year in Detroit, there were some almost 700 homicides committed black on black. Uh, and we think that in all of this emotional trauma, the sense of despair, degradation, joblessness, hopelessness, rootlessness, the inability to get a job, a decent home, the inability to live, the good life that's portrayed every night on television that we look at, uh, leads to the kind of emotional instability that will do that. And you're not going to stop homicides by getting more policemen or by simply banning handguns. It, you'll simply change the way we kill each other from pistols to knives and from knives to clubs and from clubs to feet if we have to do it. What I'm suggesting is that the root cause of many of the problems will trace it back themselves back to many social economic problems and solving them was not an overnight thing. It'll take years to redress those balances. Hooks carries that message with him everywhere. Its form may differ as the audience changes from a handful of reporters to an NAACP banquet, but the content remains the same. Young black people are more out to die from homicide between the ages of 21 and 44 than from any single disease because we have turned our violence in on ourselves and more than 9,000 black folk get killed every year in this country, not by police brutality, not by state troopers, not by dogs, not by fire hoses turned on them by Bull Connor, but by black folk who kill, maim, and destroy each other every day of our life. Maybe he saw that when he talked about dark and even though I've joined in the criticism of President Carter about many things that I still happen to believe, that Jimmy Carter is a decent, compassionate human being who can be reached, whose conscience can be stirred and troubled. And I'm among those who are going to trouble the water until somebody speaks. I, 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 I you know, don't want to look like I'm dropping names, but I was at the White House the other morning for a briefing on the Panama Canal Treaty. And there was a whole lot of folk there, only four blacks were there. But when Jimmy Carter came in, people had been talking about how tired and weary and worn he looked. He didn't look tired to me, he looked fresh and vibrant. And he had just left a meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus, and I knew if he was weak, he'd be dead when he got here. <laughs> and he came in, and, and, and at this August gathering that had come to talk about the Panama Canal Treaty, he spent the first minute, 10 minutes, talking about the problem of black unemployment and black joblessness, and he sent him a message to the nation that this is something we must do something about. 
And I think all of us ought to join in the fact that as long as there are millions of people who are underemployed and chronically unemployed, who wake up every morning with helplessness and hopelessness as their only breakfast, and despair for lunch and tears at night, no decent housing, no chance and no way out, that we owe something. And I think that Jimmy Carter offers the best chance for us making our way out. I rejoice in this appointment of a man like Andrew Young, who speaks the truth where the truth has not always been spoken. And I know that there are those who, who maintain that he's not diplomatic, but if diplomacy has put the world in the messes in, then maybe we need some undiplomatic means to take it out. <laughs> of course, Hook's main reason for speaking in Des Moines was to expound upon the needs of blacks in general and to spur this group toward accomplishing the goals of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. We have got to save this nation. And you look back to 1776 as I close tonight. And read those words that we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. And I don't have to be a great historian to tell you that they didn't really mean it. But whether they meant it or not, they wrote it. They published it. They proclaimed it. And they stuck by it. For 201 years now, we've been engaged in a great crusade to make those words come true. It's great to realize that only in a few places and a few times have men and women ever had the privileges that we had. So this is a great country. And I don't want us to give up on it. I will, I, I, I've never advocated violent overthrow. I've never said the white folk come down. I have said and I am saying move over because we're on our way. Make room for it. Presidential Press Secretary Jody Powell came to Des Moines to talk with Iowa Democrats and to address the Iowa Daily Press Association. He spent a good part of his day here talking with reporters about the constantly changing status of the Burt Lance investigation and the White House position on that investigation. His visit and our conversation with him predated several significant developments in that situation, such as Mr. Lance's testimony before the Senate committee and the events that followed that appearance. Our conversation also predated Powell's charges concerning Senator Charles Percy's campaign practices and Powell's subsequent apology to the Illinois senator. These and events that happened before his Des Moines visit have brought rise to charges from many quarters that the Carter White House lacks a certain political savvy. To be blunt, that the people running the country these days don't really know what they're doing. We asked Powell how he answered charges like that. I don't think you do because the fact of the matter is that in many cases uh, we don't know all that we need to know and, and, and it, 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 it's the nature of the business that most decisions are made on uh, woefully inadequate information and uh, 
in the long term, probably the only way to deal with it is as people become uh, more educated to the fact, and perhaps as politicians become more willing to admit that uh, quite often when we make a decision, we, we try to do the best we can, but uh, it is not uh, because we're in some unique position to know a heck of a lot more than uh, the people sitting out there watching it on television do. And certainly never that we all know all that we need to know in order to make those decisions. And that, uh, you know, that we make mistakes just like everybody else does. And the difference in the past has been that uh, politicians uh, weren't willing to admit those mistakes and uh, so people, as, uh, as you might expect, weren't very understanding of them. I hope we will uh, be willing to admit mistakes as we make them and uh, to change uh, when we need to change and the facts seem to warrant it and not get uh, uh, our feelings hurt too bad when people uh, point out the mistakes that we made. Do you feel that we've so collectively lost our innocence that nobody's ever safe anymore in public office, that everyone is, is fair game for this sort of thing? Well, in a way, being in public office does mean and should mean that you're a uh, fair game. But it shouldn't mean that you've got to be perfect because <laughs> nobody is. And we've all done things at one point or another in our lives that uh, we wished we hadn't done that we knew we shouldn't have done at the time. I certainly have. And that uh, would be kind of embarrassing if uh, the whole world knew about them. But when you're in, in public life, maybe it's, it's uh, proper that the whole world should know. But we can't get ourselves into a position that we expect everybody that serves in public office uh, not to have done things that, uh, that, uh, that were mistakes. It shouldn't have been done. And I think yeah, that's that's going to have to be a gradual process, but it, it, it is going to have to be, uh, there is going to have to be you know, a greater sense of perspective about the fact that uh, when mistakes are made, most often they're not out of malicious or evil intent in government any more than they are in the press or any more than they are in, in private life. They're because... Uh, People are human and make mistakes. What have you learned most about being in the White House uh, from the trials and tribulations you've experienced there? Well, perhaps that some of the things that uh, seem the most upsetting and uh, get your uh, temper up the worst uh, at the time, seen from even the perspective of a week or two, turn out to be uh, not particularly all that important. That uh, in some ways the decisions and the way decisions are made uh, in a White House, certainly as far as a press office is concerned, are not that much different from uh, a governor's office. The problems in general terms are, are much the same. And uh, perhaps more than anything else, a feeling that uh, even though we're not going to solve uh, or even begin to solve all the problems that we face, that, that the process at least and the beginning and, and the making of progress on those problems is a man manageable sort of thing and it, it, can be, uh, it can be done. How do you deal with the concept, the, the problem that is very, it's very real and it happens all the time um, of press secretary as news creator rather than merely a, a conduit? What, where does your opinion become your opinion, and where does that, that become Jimmy Carter's statement, and, and how do people tell the difference? Well, I, it's a very difficult process. I think the press secretary, because of the daily briefings, has that office has taken over on a, a too large a role. I've tried to keep the things on a less formal basis to try to soften that impact some. But uh, there is an unavoidable aspect of it, which is, as newsmaker, you can't sit down with the president every morning and uh, determine 
exactly how he would answer every question that is liable to come up in an hour or an hour and a half briefing that day. And you have to some extent speak, uh, use your judgment about uh, what his response would be. And uh, you have to, to phrase your responses to unanticipated questions in the way that, that uh, you think best reflects the, uh, the administration view. So you do make news sometimes. Sometimes you intend to, and every now and then <laughs> you make some when you, uh, when you didn't intend to. And it, 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 it's almost unavoidable. And being cautious and, and uh, trying to be as informed as, po as possible is about the only way that I can think of that you can, you can minimize the uh, difficulties that can arise from that. It's my impression from your biographies that, that you're, the one career position that you've held since leaving graduate school is as press secretary to Jimmy Carter. That's right. What sort of limitations or advantages, perhaps, do you think that that kind of perspective uh, has given you? Well, the disadvantage, of course, is that never having worked as a reporter, I don't have that personal understanding of the uh, trials and tribulations and frustrations uh, of the people that I'm working with that I might have had if I had been a, a working reporter. The advantage, I suppose, is that my primary function is to attempt to represent and explain uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's attitude on various uh, issues, important and uh, sometimes unimportant, uh, to the members of the press. And having a long uh, uh, knowledge of him and, and uh, how he works and how he thinks, and having heard him uh, discuss uh, pretty near everything that uh, you can hear somebody discuss over the course of the past, uh, I don't know, six or eight years, perhaps that enables me to be uh, a little bit uh, more knowledgeable of a spokesman than might, uh, might otherwise uh, be the case. But frankly, I think the job itself, except for the, the uh, benefit that uh, would have come from uh, being a reporter and then perhaps being more understanding of the people I deal with, I'm not sure what uh, normal occupation on the face of the earth would prepare you for, <laughs> for the job that I presently hold. It doesn't. It doesn't bear any relationship to any sort of honorable uh, trade that I've been able to tell. A little while ago, you finished speaking to a group of people and, and individuals crowded around you and asked for your autograph, wanted to have their picture taken with you, sort of the accoutrements of being a celebrity hound your footsteps. Does that rest easily on your shoulders? It's, it, is, it is so new that I still don't really know exactly how to, how to react, as a, as a matter of fact, and my little girl is particularly uh, nauseated by the whole thing <laughs> and uh, as want to ask why all these people want to talk to her daddy. <laughs> she knows very well that there's no real reason that he could be interesting to, to that many people <laughs> and can't understand why. But it, it, I, th I guess the worst part of it is, you know, you spend your whole life expecting that if somebody recognizes you and calls you by name that you have met them before and that good manners would require that you remember their name and call them by name and speak back. And uh, to be s sort of all of a sudden in a position where people speak to you by name and you haven't seen them before and you can't call them by name, as you sort of feel, you, f you feel like you're, you're one continual example of bad manners for the, you know, for the whole day long because you can't, you can't respond in the way that you, that you know you're, that you're supposed to. And I, that's probably been the worst part of it. How easy is it or how willing are you to uh, say, to Jimmy Carter, no, you're wrong? I think that's really a wrong decision or a wrong idea about that situation. I, that has sort of been my function since, <laughs> since the very beginning. And... Uh, and that you, nobody likes to be told that they're wrong, and nobody likes to be the person that does that. But that is about, that is probably the chief value of, of a staff person, outside of just providing the role information, is that willingness to, uh, to dispute, to argue, to raise uh, a countering point of view. Uh, some you win and, and, uh, and some you lose. But uh, our whole relationship started in 1970 when he and I were traveling during the gubernatorial campaign and every message that was that that he got from the campaign headquarters uh, was relayed for the most part through me and so I not only had to 
had to advance my own arguments about what we ought not not to do, but in some cases I had to uh, act as a spokesman for uh, uh, Hamilton Jordan back in Atlanta uh, and argue uh, his point of view with the, with the candidate. And uh, sometimes I didn't even agree with it. So, <laughs> so it, 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 and I think most people, uh, one of the unfortunate aspects of that is I sort of got uh, in a position that I was expected to do that. And so when on uh, people would have something unpleasant to tell the boss and if they couldn't quite bring themselves to do it, they, they, would, they would always come to me and say, well, Jody's used to doing that, so <laughs> why don't you do it? He's used to hearing it from you, which, which uh, uh, on occasion I still do. How do you rate your credibility? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I consider myself pretty credible. Unfortunately, that's not uh, <laughs> the measurement that really matters, and you'd have to talk to the people that, that uh, that I work with from day to day. I, I, I consider that to be not only the most important, but a, probably almost the only uh, thing that I have to offer. And if I, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if I uh, lose that, then uh, my ability to be any service to uh, the president uh, in that position will be over. So it's important to me. I uh, have an and we'll continue to do everything I can to maintain it. Whether I'm successful or not is uh, something we'll just, we'll just have to see. Would you lie for Jimmy Carter? Not for him, no. I might, I can hypothesize a situation in which there would be a higher good than my own uh, credibility. I don't think such a situation is likely uh, to occur and I think one of the uh, the uh, the measures of whether you do the job well or not is whether you can avoid putting yourself in a situation. But if it were, for example, a time of war and it and and on the one side of the balance was my credibility, and the other side was someone else's life, that would be a rather difficult uh, choice to make if you said. Uh, Never on other, any, under any circumstances you know, would I be anything other than absolutely truthful. So I'm not saying that government has a right to lie. I am saying that, uh, that uh, one can hypothesize a situation in which one's own uh, personal credibility is not the highest uh, value in the world. And that's our look at a couple of national figures who, in recent days, dropped in on central Iowa and at issue. Next week at this time on Iowa Perspectives, a place to grow will take you to the Monroe County town of Albia for a look at life in south central Iowa. So be sure to join us then. I'm Twyla Young. Good night.